policy interest rate uh, unchanged at one and three quarters percent. So it's news to no one that we're living in unsettled times. The world economy continues to be buffeted by trade conflict and relations between the United States and China are on a roller coaster. Cette incertitude persistante a déjà fait des dégâts. La croissance mondiale en a souffert. Le Canada a aussi souffert parce que son économie dépend du commerce. Les, produits, les, les prix des produits de base, qui ont un grand impact sur notre économie, ont diminué presque toute l'année. Les investissements des entreprises ont baissé et la faiblesse de la demande mondiale a nuit à nos exportations. But Canada also has notable strengths, and inflation remains on target here. Our strong labor market points to sources of growth in jobs, such as computer system design and other professional services, education, health care, and financial services. It is because of this strength amid the turmoil that we say Canada is resilient, although it is not immune to the global turmoil. This resilience has helped the Bank of Canada chart its own course in monetary policy. Many people have been wondering why we've held our policy rate steady over the past year, while many other central banks in the world have kept theirs, have lowered their rates. The comparison between Canada and the United States is front of mind. In 2019, the Federal Reserve cut its rate three times, partly as insurance against the negative effects of the global environment. In Canada, we've kept our policy unchanged since October of last year. That divergence is not as stark as it's sometimes portrayed. When all said and done, by this October, the Bank of Canada and the Fed actually ended up with pretty much the same policy rate. But it is sometimes believed we must do whatever the Fed does because our economy is so closely tied to that of our largest trading partner. With that in mind, I'd like to take this opportunity to explain the path we've taken, not just in terms of yesterday's decision, but also over a longer time period. Dans mon, mon discours, je vais passer en revue les chemins différents que le Canada et les États-Unis ont suivis ces dernières années. Je vais ensuite analyser la situation actuelle et expliquer les raisons de notre décision concernant les taux directeurs. It's now been more than a decade since the global financial crisis and the onset of the Great Recession worldwide. That makes this a good time to briefly review the history because it helps us understand where we are now. Policy interest rates in Canada and the United States have followed distinct tracks over the past 10 years, reflecting different macroeconomic forces. La crise financière mondiale a touché ces deux pays de façon différente. Lors de la récession de 2009, les pertes de production canadienne et américaine étaient comparables, mais pas pour les mêmes raisons. Les États-Unis ont connu une crise financière interne. Certaines grandes institutions financières n'ont pas résisté et beaucoup d'autres ont été menacées. Par comparaison, le système financier canadien a été solide mais les exportations et les prix des produits de base ont plongé. Les banques centrales des deux pays ont tous les deux réagi en baissant les taux d'intérêt autant qu'elles le, le pensaient alors possible. De plus, la Réserve fédérale a mis en place une série de mesures de politique monétaire non traditionnelles. Au Canada, on a renforcé le bas taux d'intérêt grâce aux indications prospectives Il s'agit de l'engagement conditionnel de laisser le taux des directeurs à près de zéro pendant un, au moins un an, sauf en cas de reprise de l'inflation. Mais nos mesures se sont arrêtées là. Dans les deux pays, comme dans une bonne partie du monde, la politique budgétaire a fortement stimulé la demande pendant la récession. After these policy measures, Canada bounced back quickly. Exports and investment rebounded, in part reflecting higher commodity prices. The United States had a slower recovery from that 2009 recession. The Bank of Canada, uh, because of our uh, strengthening economy, raised rates by 75 basis points to 1% in 2010, whereas the Fed 
held its rate near zero for more than five years longer than that. Starting in 2010, as the recovery appeared to be underway, most major economies began a course of fiscal consolidation. In Canada, the government took steps to move the federal budget towards balance. The United States, on its side, implemented a policy of automatic spending cuts triggered by U.S. budget law, known as sequestration. With the benefit of hindsight, those moves towards balanced budgets proved to be premature. The world was actually in for several more years of lackluster growth. Competitiveness challenges facing Canadian exports also dampened business investment in the non-energy sector of Canada. As Canada's economy continued to fall short of its potential, the Bank of Canada ended up keeping the policy rate at 1%. Meanwhile, the U.S. economy was turning around, and in 2013, the Fed was hinting at tapering its purchases of financial assets. Now, another turn of events was, uh, was five years ago, with, uh, and, and uh, really between 2014 and 2016, Canada had a major setback with a collapse in the price of oil and other co commodities. We ended up with actually a technical recession, meaning two quarters of, consecutively of negative growth in 2015. The Bank of Canada cushioned the blow by cutting our policy rate twice in, in 2015 uh, to, to half a percent. The Canadian dollar depreciated by more than 20% against the, against the US dollar, and that facilitated the adjustment to those lower commodity prices. In addition, the federal government um, came in with some other measures, including the child tax benefit that added fiscal stimulus to the economy. In contrast, as the US growth continued, um, because they were not as heavily dependent on commodity production, um, the Fed began to slowly normalize their policy interest rate and reflecting the more favorable U.S. economic situation, the U.S. dollar appreciated against quite a number of different currencies. During this period, inflation was running below target in both countries, both in Canada and the U.S. Now then, in 2017 to 18, uh, we had a period when economies worldwide were expanding largely in sync. A major fiscal boost in the United States, in fact, uh, was actually pushing economic growth there above the, uh, the normal potential of the U.S. economy. Canada, uh, meanwhile, was reaching close to our potential, and our core inflation measures reached target and have really been staying there uh, ever since. This expansion of the economies allowed both the Bank of Canada and the Federal Reserve to raise rates towards what is viewed as a neutral range. Still, Canada re remains somewhat behind in this process of normalizing our policy rates because we'd had that setback associated with the collapse of our commodity prices. J'aimerais vous parler d'une autre différence importante entre les deux économies. Aux États-Unis, la bulle immobilière a éclaté en 2007 à 2008. Mais au Canada, le marché du logement a poursuivi sa croissance, sa croissance uh, sa croissance et la dette hypothécaire a continué de s'accumuler au cours des dix, dix, dix ans qui ont suivi la crise financière mondiale. Les Canadiens ont beaucoup emprunté et les prix moyens des logements ont, ont atteint des niveaux élevés, quelle que soit la mesure utilisée. Cette situation est due notamment à les bas taux d'intérêt dans un contexte où les ménages avaient la capacité d'emprunter et où les banques commerciales demeuraient très bien dotées en fonds propres. Les facteurs créent des, ces facteurs créent des vulnérabilités qui pourraient amplifier tout choc négatif pour notre économie. Entre 2016 et 2018, un ensemble de mesures visant le marché du logement ont été adoptées. En plus de la hausse des taux d'intérêt, des mesures macroprudentielles, par exemple la ligne directrice B20 concernant les tests de, résist de résistance, ont resserré les conditions d'octroi des prêts hypothécaires. Pour contrer la spéculation, des provinces et municipalités ont imposé des taxes aux investisseurs non résidents, surtout à Vancouver et à Toronto. Ces mesures ont calmé le marché du logement dans ces régions et fait reculer les prix sur les marchés en surchauffe. 
Starting in late last year, the Canadian economy was slowing down once again. The cooling housing market and adjustments in the energy sector relating to transportation capacity constraints and associated curtailments were weighing on growth. Weak business investment and exports in the sector contributed to the slowdown. <coughs> Trade conflicts were also a headwind. As an open economy, Canada is hurt by the weaker foreign demand and lower commodity prices that come from trade conflicts. The United States is less dependent on trade, but as their conflicts have escalated, has increasingly had the added drag of tariffs on their economy. Both countries, and indeed the whole world, were adversely affected by the uncertainties around trade conflict. On the monetary policy front, U.S. inflation has also been running below target. The Fed has therefore cut interest rates three times during 2019. In contrast, the Bank of Canada has not cut rates. In part, this is because inflation and its outlook in Canada remain on track. And also because our policy rate was lower to begin with. Moreover, because Canada already has high levels of household debt, lowering rates further could make those vulnerabilities worse and amplify any future shocks that might occur. In sum, there is no reason for the Bank of Canada always to move in step with the Fed. On the contrary, the experience of the past decade shows that Canada and the United States have often followed different roads, reflecting differences in our economic conditions. Canada does share many of the same macro fundamentals as the United States. For long periods, the two economies are highly correlated, so monetary can be, policy can be very similar during those periods. But Canada is a more open economy with greater dependence on natural resource industries. For that reason, we are more exposed to world events, both directly through demand for our exports and indirectly through commodity prices. As a result, there have been extended periods when our monetary policies have diverged. It is also because of those differences that Canada benefits from having a flexible exchange rate. This brings us to the present. How is the economy evolving now, and what does that mean for the outlook? Global economic growth has slowed significantly over the course of this year, and it appears now to be leveling off. The bank still expects that it will edge higher again in the period ahead. Ce ralentissement mondial est dû en partie au fait que l'économie américaine est stimulée par les mesures de relance budgétaire dont les effets s'atténuent depuis. Il est aussi dû aux efforts des autorités chinoises pour remédier au fort endettement des entreprises et des municipalités en Chine. Dans ce contexte, les conflits commerciaux ont plombé les échanges mondiaux ainsi que la confiance et les investissements des entreprises. Les effets négatifs des conflits commerciaux ne sont que partiellement compensés par l'assouplissement de la politique monétaire. Since our last full forecast presented in our October Monetary Policy Report, or NPR, the trade news has been mixed. The Canada-US-Mexico trade agreement has appear been appearing to be close to ratification. For most of the period, headlines have been suggesting progress in the trade conflict between the United States and China, although there continue to be many twists and turns. Financial markets, already being strongly supported by central bank actions, have been reacting to the trade news as it comes in. Stock prices have moved close to record levels, credit spreads have generally narrowed, and market volatility has been very low. At the same time, uncertainty is likely to persist even if a deal is reached between the United States and China, and that uncertainty is likely to have a lasting effect. Although global recession is not in our baseline forecast, questions remain about whether market pricing fully reflects the risks inherent in the current global situation. Commodity prices have been comparatively stable in the recent period. In this context, the Canadian dollar has also been quite stable, keeping within quite a narrow range. Turning to the Canadian economy, the bank 
has been forecasting slower economic growth in the second half of 2019 after a very strong second quarter of this year. That is indeed how the data are coming in. Economic growth in the third quarter was 1.3%, which is what we projected in our October monetary policy report. Underlying this slowdown in overall GDP growth was an outright decline in Canada's exports. This has been driven by global weakness and trade uncertainty and by a reversal of some temporary factors that have previously boosted growth, particularly for non-energy commodity exports. Furthermore, the pace of inventory accumulation slowed, subtracting significantly from growth. On the positive side, final domestic demand in Canada grew at quite a solid pace. One thing that has surprised us was business investment. We were expecting investment to decline in the second half of this year, but instead we've been seeing solid growth. Moreover, data have been revised upward, revealing that investment earlier this year was higher than was previously reported. The sector du logement qui continue de se redresser est une autre source de vigueur. La plupart des régions ont vu monter les reventes et les mises en chantier. Ceci après une période d'ajustement durant laquelle les effets des politiques nationales et provinciales se sont fait sentir. L'activité dans le secteur est aussi stimulée par la forte croissance de l'emploi et des salaires, les niveaux élevés d'immigration et les faibles coûts d'emprunt des ménages qui découlent de la baisse des taux d'intérêt dans le monde. Les prix des logements ont aussi légèrement augmenté et les emprunts des ménages ont grimpé. Les dépenses de consommation ont également contribué à la croissance. Comme nous l'avons dit en octobre, la vigueur du marché du travail, surtout dans le secteur des services, a soutenu l'économie canadienne. L'emploi s'est stabilisé en octobre, mais après avoir réalisé des gains importants. De plus, les salaires qui peuvent servir de baromètre des conditions globales du marché du travail ont encore monté. Dans l'ensemble, les données semblent indiquer que le marché du travail continue de se resserrer. Les données historiques révisées montrent aussi que le revenu disponible et l'épargne des ménages canadiens sont plus élevés que l'on avait estimé. Les données récentes laissent présager une amélioration de la situation financière et, les, et des dépenses futures des ménages malgré une perte de confiance des consommateurs. Government spending is a mixed picture. While it has been supporting growth recently, this support is expected to wane in 2020 as fiscal consolidation in Ontario and in Alberta takes hold and the recent strength in Quebec and British Columbia normalize. These dynamics were built into our October projection. On the federal side, the government's fiscal plans are pending. The slowing of growth in Canada's economy has been con concentrated in goods producing industries which were more heavily affected by the trade conflict and by lower commodity prices. The service sector, which now accounts for about 70% of the economy, has continued to show solid growth for some time. Our overall assessment is that the Canadian economy is near capacity. However, this masks significant regional differences. Oil producing regions continue to go through a painful adjustment to lower oil prices and transportation capacity constraints. And the labour market in Alberta has been quite weak. Meanwhile, some other provinces are seeing strong growth in employment and wages. Enfin, l'inflation demeure à la cible d'une manière générale. En effet, les mesures d'inflation fondamentales se maintiennent autour de 2%. En octobre, l'inflation mesurée par l'indice des prix de à la consommation globale s'est chiffrée à 1,9%. On s'attend à ce qu'elle se fluctue, à, à, fluctue autour de 2%. Les chiffres d'octobre dépassent quelque peu nos prévisions en raison de la hausse du coût des billets d'avion. On s'attend à ce que l'inflation dépasse temporairement 2% dans les prochains mois, sous l'effet des bas prix de l'essence observés un an plus tôt. L'inflation mesurée par l'IPC devrait ensuite revenir à la cible qui est 2 
This takes up, us up to yesterday's policy decision. Overall, the tone of developments in recent weeks gives us more confidence in the outlook for growth and inflation that we set out in October. So as I and my colleagues on Governing Council decided that the current setting of the policy interest rate remains appropriate to keep the economy on track so that inflation remains at its 2% target. In our discussion, we noted some initial signs that global economic growth is beginning to level off as expected. In particular, we noted a recent improvement in global business investment and trade, as well as a stabilization in manufacturing purchasing managers indexes. We continue to expect that global growth will edge higher over the next couple of years. We noted that central bank actions have been supporting financial markets and that prices in many markets have been reflecting an easing of concerns about the possibility of a global recession. However, it is clear that trade conflicts remain the biggest risk to the Canadian and global economies, and the related uncertainty is continuing to dampen growth and business investment. We also noted that the Canadian dollar has been relatively stable. Turning to the Canadian economy, recent data showed that the economy slowed sharply in the third quarter, but they also support our forecast that this slowdown will turn out to be temporary. Governing Council talked about the surprising length, strength of investment in the quarter. The bank will need to assess the extent to which this strength is likely to be maintained, as well as the implications for both economic growth and for potential output. We also discussed the strong housing markets and moderate consumer spending seen during the third quarter. At the same time, consumer credit growth has picked up. Given these developments, we will continue to monitor how financial vulnerabilities evolve in the context of regulatory changes designed to keep riskier lending in check. Nos décisions à venir concernant les taux d'intérêt vont être guidées par notre évaluation continue de l'incidence économique des conflits commerciaux. Nous allons aussi surveiller les sources de résilience dans l'économie canadienne, notamment les dépenses de consommation et l'activité dans le secteur du logement. Et nous allons tenir compte de l'évolution de la politique budgétaire au moment de, au moment de mettre à jour nos prévisions en janvier. Looking ahead, our interest rate decisions will be guided by our continuing assessment of the economic impact of trade conflicts. We will also be watching the sources of resilience in the Canadian economy, notably consumer spending and housing activity. And we will take into account developments in fiscal policy as we prepare to update our outlook in January. Well, thank you, and I look forward to your questions. Questions. Does anybody have anything uh, from the floor? And if not, can I ask my question? Okay. <laughs> so you may just to start the ball rolling. I'm sure people have questions. People do. So um, I think, from a practical sense, uh, with tightening of mortgage rules, uh, a lot of people are looking at going through secondary lenders. And will that have an impact on your forecast of what's going on, or is that sort of built into your thinking? Well, we do. Uh, yeah, we, we, we certainly have been observing that. And uh, I mean, I guess over the last several years, we've had a tightening of rules. And first of all, in the just for insured mortgages, and then later that's been extended to, to other forms of lending. But there are still, of course, other lenders that are not being covered. And, and of course, to the extent that that occurs, it may create risks in, in places that are less easily managed. And so that is part of our overall assessment of uh, of the risks to financial stability in Canada. And the concern is that, you know, if, if people are kind of going around some of these rules which are designed to make the system safer and to sort of prevent, uh, prevent the, kind of, uh, uh, the kind of dynamic that I talked about where, uh, you know, if, if something bad happens to the economy, then that if the effects get amplified by the fact that people are having trouble, um, people are having trouble making their mortgage payments, then, um, you know, that's something that's going to be, uh, going to be a bigger concern. So, uh, so it is something we've been monitoring. And, you know, at, at, at this point, it's, I, I think it's not, um, it, it, it's not a, you know, it's not a, uh, a huge part of the mortgage uh, situation, but it's certainly something that bears watching. <coughs> yes? Do you see any uh, trends in like the price flatness of all the 
indications? Well, we certainly did, uh, up until a couple of years ago, there were certainly a lot of indications of froth in the, uh, in the housing markets, particularly in Vancouver and Toronto. And some of that was, um, was uh, clearly related to people trying to park their money somewhere that was comparatively safe and with, uh, with, with you know, pretty stable environment and so on. And, uh, and, and Canada did seem to be attracting some of those safe haven flows. Um, of course, there were also Canadian investors who were thinking that, uh, that investing in real estate was a pretty good, uh, you know, a good, a good choice for them at that time. So, so we really had a number of things that were contributing to that, uh, to that sort of overheated uh, uh, situation in those housing markets. Um, now, of course, what we have seen more recently is that the rules were tightened up, uh, as I was talking about, and the, uh, you know, in particular, the, uh, the provincial and municipal measures that were taken in, in, in Ontario and British Columbia have been kind of dampening down some of that speculation. But at the same time, um, to some extent, that's also been resulted in some of the investment flows going to other places. And as you said, Ottawa, Montreal, have, and Victoria, for that matter, at one point saw a pickup in their, uh, in their real estate markets around the time that the rules were tightened in, the, uh, in, in, in those uh, uh, you know, previously uh, quite, uh, uh, you know, quite overheated uh, uh, regional markets. Hello. Yeah, Richard Ferland. Uh, what was the uh, impact of the uh, of the trade agreement between the Europe and Canada on the economy? And if do you see something uh, in in the future about about this uh, agreement? Well, it has uh, I th for us. It is a positive. Uh impact that we, you know, of course, we're watching how it unfolds. Uh, um, I, I think in, in general, uh, you know, these things take time because generally businesses have to, uh, uh, have to make adjustments to their, uh, to their planning and to their, uh, often their investments involved in, in uh, uh, you know, sometimes changing their supply chains to take advantage of the availability of imports from the countries where trade is open up, but also to take advantage of new export markets. And so you've got often a kind of a reshuffling process that may take some time to play out, but it's certainly uh, something that we view as being, you know, positive impact on Canada in the period ahead. But of course, against that, we have the whole um, uncertainty around a lot of our existing trade agreements. And, you know, of course, Canada for, for, de for a few decades now has been benefiting with free trade, uh, from free trade with the United States. And the fact that that's been put in question by the uh, this whole renegotiation process and the long delays in ratification of the new agreement has also been, uh, you know, been dampening a lot of business investment and making it hard for businesses to, to, to make their plans with some confidence. Thank you. Yeah. Hi, um, <clears throat> Thierry Harris. How vulnerable, uh, you mentioned in 2008 that the, I'm over here. Yes. Uh, you mentioned in 2008 the uh, economy in the United States really tanked after the housing crisis over there, and Canada's economy uh, actually grew uh, with commodity prices being high and global growth being high. How worried are you and how vulnerable are Canadian banks to the housing bubble in Canada right now? Well, um, it, it's... Uh I mean, certainly the current situation, I mean, our, our assessment is that the Canadian financial system is still uh, very resilient. And even though we have been highlighting for quite some time now the, the risks to the overall system associated with this buildup of household indebtedness and the fact that, uh, that um, you know, the fact that that has been building up to levels that are pretty high. Um, that, um, that it, 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 uh, there are still a number of factors that make it less concerning than it would otherwise be. Um, you know, and, and you saw that chart that I put up that, you know, that our household indebtedness has, has just kept building to a level that's now higher than the U.S. was before the crisis. But it's partly the composition of the debt has been sort of shifted towards less risky borrowing. And whereas in the U.S. you had this sort of uh, push towards riskier and riskier borrowers, in, in, in Canada the rules have been tightened up as, even as this sort of uh, level of borrowing has increased. And so, um, you know, Canadian borrowers, Canadian households are required to put down bigger down payments. Than, than was required in the U.S. They, they, you know, there are more checks in, in terms of the credit quality and, and, and that sort of thing. And that's, that's been a, a protection against the, uh, you know, against the kinds of problems we had in the U.S. Another thing is that our banks are very well capitalized and very resilient. And, and you know, every, uh, 
every year the uh, you know our uh, superintendent of financial institutions does a, a stress test and you know tries to, to to look at a big extreme scenario where you know some very bad shock hits the the, the Canadian economy and to see what the effects on the banks would be and and generally you can, it, it's hard to do anything that will uh, in those simulations that will actually uh, that will actually uh, uh, cause major uh, major uh, uh, stress to, uh, to to Canadian banks. So it's so uh, again, it's something that's that we're keeping an eye on. It is it is a concern, and particularly because if uh, because as the debt builds up, it could amplify a negative shock to the economy. Um, but but it's uh, but, but but still that that resilience of the system is quite uh, important to keep in mind. Yes. This past summer, the bank identified climate change as a systemic risk to be monitored. Can you elaborate a little bit on what it is that you are looking for, how you are monitoring the effects of climate change, and what the implications of that might be? Yeah, well, it is. I mean, climate change is, certainly has the potential to be a um, to, to be a major uh, uh, factor affecting the Canadian economy over uh, over the, the years and, and decades to come, and uh, and. Um, it, it, you know, partly because of the increased severity of uh, of, of, uh, of weather, um, the fact we've had uh, extremes of, of, of uh, you know drought and uh, flooding and uh, and forest fires and so on, and each time those events occur, they imply some loss of uh, of economic uh, capacity, and uh, they're they're also a disruption uh, to to parts of the economy, and. Uh, and, uh, and, and you've also got structural changes that are associated with climate change itself. But meanwhile, you've also, of course, got the effort to move to a lower carbon economy, and that involves a big structural change as well, and that particularly for an economy like Canada that relies heavily on, uh, on generating, uh, on producing uh, uh, um, uh, uh, petroleum products and other, uh, other uh, uh, fossil fuels to uh, uh, you know that that the, the, uh, the shift to a lower carbon economy is clearly going to require a, sh a structural adjustment for Canada, but you know, but for other other countries as well. And um, obviously, these are things that are going to be playing out over a, a longer time frame than we usually think about at the Bank of Canada for monetary policy. Usually, we're we're thinking about the next two years, um, and and most of these are things that work over a much longer time frame. Um, they have effects on, uh, but they do have effects on how the macroeconomy works, and they have effects on on the on the stability of the financial system because financial institutions are also exposed to the um, to the effects both of the uh, of, of climate change itself, you know, the various extreme weather events, but also they're exposed to the uh, to the the. the uh, um, the industries that may be affected by these structural changes that I, that I was talking about. So, um, so we um, at the Bank of Canada are increasingly trying to uh, to get a to get a get a better uh, set of analysis of of how these longer term changes are going to be affecting uh, affecting uh, the, the the functioning of the Canadian economy, but also of the financial system. It's a, it's a complicated issue, and it kind of takes us outside of our normal uh, the normal range of things that we look at. But we're I think we benefit from the the fact that this is a global problem and central banks in many other countries are looking at the same sorts of issues and so we're now um, as of this year we joined something called the network for greening the financial system which uh, is, is a forum through which we can, we're collaborating with other central banks and comparing notes on so sort of what kind of um, I mean one of the things that they look at for example is is you know risk scenarios you know well what if uh, things worked uh, you know turned out in some adverse way and and we do stress tests or, or risk scenarios for in a variety of contexts, but climate-related scenarios are something that uh, increasingly central banks are considering. So, again, it's a it's a long-term uh, problem and a long-term work program, but it is one that we're uh, that we're increasingly seeing as, as being important to uh, to to fulfilling our mandate uh, for 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 the Canadian economy and financial system. Yes. Uh, quickly, we talked about, or you talked about earlier, about uh, the European Trade Agreement, and and then we talk about, you know, some of the longer-term impacts that, um, you know, uh, uh, the economic or sorry, our greening of the world. Um, what about Brexit? I mean, is I mean, obviously, that's a more near-term impact. Is the bank just sort of looking at as, yeah, there's going to be some flexibility in uh, risk in the next couple of years, but it'll just work itself through. Well, I mean, I think on Brexit there are quite a few alter alternative scenarios in terms of how it plays out. Um, uh, certainly, our, our uh, 
baseline assumes that some, the Brexit happens, but it happens in an orderly way. So we've got an impact, but it's not a huge impact. And in particular, I think the concern with a disorderly Brexit or a, you know, a hard Brexit, one without a deal, and, uh, you know, and, and with acrimonious relations afterwards, is that uh, you know you you would be concerned also about the financial system impact, but but it's clear that Brexit is going to have a big economy impact on the European and the European economy and the European and the British economies, and um, and that's and that impact in general should be negative. Um, it's it's one that um, it, it's one that uh, you know it, it reflects the fact that. Uh, that over the years, you know, Britain has been an integrated part of the European economy, and you've got uh, you've got supply chains that crisscross the English Channel, and uh, and so a lot of industries that are dependent on those supply chains are going to find it a lot more cumbersome to manage their activities, and that's going to result in in a lot of industries having to reorganize themselves in ways that are probably going to be detrimental to the whole. Uh, European economy, and arguably that's one of the reasons that we've seen a softening of economic growth and in business investment in Europe and recently that a lot of businesses are just trying to figure out how this is going to play out. And uh, I mean, Britain is part of their business model and they have to figure out what, what that's going to mean in the future. So, uh, but for Canada, this is a, I mean, this is an impact to the extent it's part of the world economy, but our direct uh, links to Britain are not huge. Our financial exposures are not large enough to be of serious concern. So it's really more of a, of a, of a collective global problem than it is a specifically Canadian one. Out of time, okay. All right, well, th thank you very much, Tim, for coming this morning and sharing your insights. I know we were trying to keep this a secret, but the speaker gift is now out of 